Welcome back everyone. We are talking about method of production for minimally and maximally processed foods. Now, in my previous slideshow where we were talking about uh, Canada's food guide, there was a discussion in the 2019 version of the food guide that said avoid eating uh, highly processed foods. And when asking Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency what they define as a highly processed food, they're indicating that it is a food that has a number of maximal processes and they made a definition of what those are. So let's walk through what those definitions are and then debate the merits of this based approach or some of the some of the conflicts that may be occurring within um, food product development teams or food manufacturing teams and figure out some different strategies where to go with this. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to define minimally and maximally processed foods by Health Canada's definition. And we'll debate the descriptive headers based on the, our understanding of food chemistry, physics, microbiology, and traditional processing. And I put traditional processing in there because some of the um, processes that are deemed um, as maximal processes under Health Canada's definition have long-standing historical tradition. And so as such, it's it's really funny to think that there there's a lot of conflict saying, well, let's not eat processed food when many of these processes have hundreds, if not thousands of years of tradition in many of uh, the different global and indigenous cultures around the world. So let's just jump out here. And just a quick reminder from our discussion about the different food guides. This is the 2019 Canada's Food Guide, and there's a lot more emphasis on eating whole fruits and vegetables, a lot of whole grains, a lot of minimally processed foods. And within the second piece of the puzzle, they had a whole section just saying, limit highly processed foods. And so I think it's important for um, us as food scientists and food technologists to think about what is that definition of a highly processed food, because there's an advocacy role to play that the food manufacturing sector has to do. We process food. That is what we do. And there's an important role for processed food within our society, whether that is um, creating convenience, extending shelf life, increasing um, accessibility of food uh, by distance, being able to trade food uh, more securely, and to create delight in food products so that people can create livelihoods and be able to uh, have businesses for this. So. Let's jump out to the, oh, guess what? It's the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. And I'm just going to escape out of here because I'm going to go straight. Again, I always joke we are friends at this point. And this is the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. And I'm going to share the link where, for you for this website in the text of the YouTube video. So uh, do go and explore this website for yourself. But um, let's just jump into what does... Health Canada and the Canadian Food Inspection Agency consider a minimum process. And so what they're saying is that certain processes are acceptable and they're normal. And as such, they do not uh, add to that highly processed food product. So they're saying aeration. So that would be uh, adding air to a food product, aging it. So think wine or cheese, allowing something to age over time. Agglomeration, so we're sticking things together. Blending, that's breaking things apart. Centrifugation, that's where you're spinning at very, very high speed to separate out solids and liquid fractions within that product. And centrifugation is often used for highly processed oils to be able to go through what's called a winterization or fractionation process. And that's where you can fractionate an oil so that you can get liquid oil or solid oil or solid fat, pardon me, from different stocks. Centrifugation is very common in that case. It's also used very commonly for protein purification. So if you're eating uh, protein isolates or so on, um, it's commonly used in the milk industry to separate cream from uh, the milk itself and to reduce the fat concentration. Uh, so let's jump ahead. Chilling and refrigerating and freezing are minimal processes, uh, self-explanatory. Chopping, 
exactly as you see fit. That could be manual chopping, but it could also be industrial chopping with a wide variety of different uh, chopping or cutting machinery. Churning, that's uh, beating a product to uh, cause the agglomeration. Agglomeration, as we said before, is sticking together. Agglomeration of fats. Cleaning, so let's just jump down. Cleaning using microorganisms. What on earth do they mean? Cleaning using microorganisms. Cleaning would just imply that you're removing debris from a food product and trimming it as necessary. Concentration without chemical change. So concentration could be, for example, in the case of frozen concentrated uh, juice. Uh, it's not as common as it used to be, but once upon a time you used to get uh, frozen concentrated juice and you would dilute it back with water. Um, but concentration would be done by either evaporating under vacuum or freeze, uh, concentrating the, uh, the water out of the product. Um, how about cutting? Con I suppose concentration too could be done by ultrafiltration. So applying uh, this product to a reverse osmosis or um, ultrafiltration membrane to remove water and small molecules, and you end up with a concentrate. And again, I might argue that that is a reasonably intensive manufacturing process. How about cutting is, and deboning? Manual deboning. Now, this one's interesting because mechanical deboning is considered a major maximal process. Meanwhile, we know that there's need for automation in a lot of um, deboning plants. And so suddenly they're changing all commodity meat into a highly processed product by suggesting that uh, mechanical deboning is a highly process or a highly maximal process within uh, within the industry. Defatting without chemical change. Um, I always beg the question, what does without chemical change mean? Defatting without chemical change could imply that you are uh, defatting by um, hydraulic extraction or twin screw extrusion, but defatting could also be, and there's no chemical change, it's just a separation uh, chemistry, but using solvents such as hexane or cyclohexane to remove fat from a sample. So uh, that's how much of the canola oil or corn oil or soybean oil is produced in Canada by applying a solvent such as hexane or cyclohexane to the seeds, the crushed seeds, and then that the liquid portion is decanted off and the uh, solvent, the hexane or cyclohexane, is evaporated off and you end up with an oil concentrate. Um, and so is that highly a uh, maximum process or a minimum process? I would argue it's a process and not put a label on it. Degerming implies that we're removing the germ fraction from a seed. Um, dissolving, um, sort of self-evident, but you're taking salts or sugars or other, other solutes and suspending them in water or another solvent. Drying, dehydration, desiccation, evaporating, and freeze drying, all means of removing water and moisture from a sample so that you can extend the shelf life. Emulsifying without synthetic chemical addition. Well, what do they mean by synthetic chemical addition? Are you... Adding lecithin, is that a synthetic chemical? What I find tricky about this is that they often are not giving additional guidance or definitions when they're putting these labels on. So a synthetic chemical addition, at what point are the different emulsifiers that, out, that are out there considered some synthetic chemicals? Um, as you could argue that, uh, let's say you're making mayonnaise, if you're using a whole egg versus using uh, soybean or sunflower lecithin, is that sunflower lecithin considered a synthetic chemical? Extrusion. Extrusion is a fantastic technology. It can be low pressure or high pressure extrusion. Um, and all sorts of wonderful chemical changes can occur that uh, increase the textural attributes of the different food products. A lot of, a lot of uh, people say extrusion is a high pr uh, process because you're able to achieve all sorts of unique textural attributes from a product that seem uncanny. So for example, many of the um, plant-based uh, meat analog products, so uh, veggie burgers and so on, the, the protein matrix is extruded under high pressure extrusion and that allows for all these string, stringy sort of textures to be created within that product. How about uh, many of the breakfast cereals that we're eating? 
um, things like Cheerios or Fruit Loops are extruded. And you take a grain and sugar uh, mixture and run it under high pressure extrusion and it pops out um, cheesies, also extruded. <laughs> Where you're just taking cornmeal and running it under high pressure extrusion. And when it, it, when it comes out of the extruder by... Um, a diabetic expansion, the, the gas, that uh, the water that's in there expands and blows up that sample really, really um, rapidly. And you end up with those really cool textures that don't otherwise exist. So is that a minimum process or a maximum process? Fermentation? Fermentation, again, I could argue that some traditional fermentations have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and other fermentations have been only around for a few years. So for example, uh, right now, one of the fermentation methods, um, there's a lot more use of different bacterial expression of different flavoring agents. And this is actually a fermentation. You have a large fermentation vessel where you are growing bacteria and different substrates, and then you're able to purify out of there things like different uh, flavoring agents. Uh, there's been research into vanilla or saffron, uh, the, the, the bioactive components from, from those plants that are otherwise very expensive, being able to synthesize them in yeast and growing them under fermentation. Is that a minimum process? Filtering and clarifying, again, in this case, I would say is, is a minimum process, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Finding and finishing, that's where we're um, clarifying a product, sometimes with uh, different different uh, clarifying agents like putting bentonite clay into a beverage and then filtering it out, it makes the product very, very clear. But very few consumers would understand the fact that you're dumping clay into your beverage and then filtering it out. Um, if you explain that to many consumers, they would be quite uh, intrigued and possibly disgusted over the fact that we're putting we're putting clay into our food products. In other cases, finding agents could be things like Kieselger or um, Isinglass and all sorts of different finding agents that are out there. Some of them are enzymatic finding agents too, where you are using pectinases or so on to break apart the different components that are clouding up a beverage. How about, uh, and you could argue that some of those pectinases are much more natural than, than uh, things that are going on. And, and I find it funny where they state without chemical change, if you're using pectinase, it's a naturally occurring enzyme and it's, breaking down the pectin, or maybe you're using a protease to break down haze in beer, um, you're finding that beer, but there's a, there's a chemical change that goes on. Is that therefore a maximally processed product? A flaking, that's where you're just rolling something to turn into small flakes. Flocculation, this is where you're uh, using either cold or a flocculating agent to drop out yeasts or proteins or haze within a product. Forming, self-evident, you're shaping something into another shape. This one I find funny. Fumigation is a minimum process. So you could be applying any number of different chemicals to grains or vegetables or fruits, and that's considered a minimum process. Uh, again, those the chemicals that are being applied, of course, are evaluated for their safety, but where we're seeing all these other statements where you can't add chemicals, but down here you can. And so it's somewhat contradictory. Grading. Self-evident, you're taking your product and making it into small pieces. Grinding, also small pieces. Heating, all sorts of different heating methodology uh, being allowed here. Canning, cooking, microwaving, pasteurizing, sterilizing. Sterilizing. What do they mean by sterilizing? Sterilizing could mean a, a few different things, but uh, sterilizing by heat, I'm making the assumption, because sterilizing can be done in other cold methods, such as use of pressure. Homogenization, that's also another just a type of mixing, so that you're mixing um, at, a, at a somewhat molecular level so that you do not have a separation of that product at a later point. It's a form of emulsification. Maturation is just another form of aging. Melting or thawing is no surprise. Milling, mixing or blending. Surprise, uh, packaging and canning. What do they mean by packaging? Packaging could be all sorts of different things. Um, do they mean use of modified atmosphere packaging? Do they mean 
use of active packaging with all sorts of different uh, chemicals embedded within the packaging material that uh, extend the shelf life of the product. Um, again, it's somewhat vague. Peeling without chemical change. A lot of the minimally processed peeling that goes on uses chemicals. So for example, tomatoes or peaches in a lot of the different industrial purses are use, they're using um, sodium hydroxide or lye as a means to peel it. Um, and this would be considered a minimum process. In other cases, um, peeling grapefruits, also using sodium hydroxide and um, hydrochloric acid to be able to make supreme slices, mandarin oranges, same deal, where you're taking the oranges, you're dipping them in a uh, sodium hydroxide bath and then a neutralized with um, hydrochloric acid. And it allows for the uh, slipping of the membranes around the insides of the fruit so that you just get those perfect um, little bits of fruit rather than a, a, the, the tough membrane around the citrus slice. Is that a chemical change? I don't know. <laughs> Some of these definitions are very, very vague. Pressing and puffing. Puffing often is uh, just another form of extrusion, but it can also be um, where you're taking and uh, radically changing the pressure on a pressure vessel, often used for puffed cereals or puffed grains. Reconstitution without chemical addition. Well, what on earth do they mean without chemical addition? If you're adding water, water is a chemical. If you're adding anything it's chemical if you're adding air it's a chemical what do they mean by without chemical addition everything in this world is a chemical ripening other than by chemical means well ripening is a chemical process and so i'm not sure what they mean by ripening other than by chemical means i realize that many fruits and vegetables can be artificially ripened by application of of um, things like ethylene gas and they can be slowed by use of uh, chemicals such as methylcyclopropene, but ripening is a chemical process. Separating, so that would be screening, clarifying, centrifugation, etc. Shelling and trimming. Shredding, smoking. This is one where without direct chemical addition, what do they mean by without direct chemical addition? If you are smoking, it is exposed to chemicals. Even if you are using natural wood smoke, it is exposed to chemicals. And so it's just weird when they're saying without chemical addition, as it just seems to me whoever made this list is not a chemist. Soaking, not surprised. Treatment with inert gases, so use of nitrogen packaging. Treatment with toxic gases. This is, again, this one is really, really quite ironic. You can treat it with toxic gases, you can fumigate it, um, but with no chemical change. So it's just bizarre. Let's jump to the next. Maximum processes. So these are processes affecting the natural character of foods with a maximum physical, chemical, or biological change. Anion exchange. And I want to jump it, uh, to the second one, cation exchange. These are where you are uh, running a product through an uh, ion exchange bed so that you can optimize the nature of that product. One of the most commonly uh, uh, consume products that goes through ion exchange is water. I have an ion exchange column in my house that every drop of tap water goes through. And so it's really quite bizarre when they say, you know, my water is now a maximally processed product because of the nature of it going through an ion exchange. It just happens that the water that I use in my house, the, the well water that I have is uh, tainted with hydrogen sulfide, and so I need ion exchange to be able to drink that tap water without thinking that my water tastes like eggs. Bleaching with chemical addition. So many of the bread products, the minim the products that we consider as minimally processed, would have ble would have been bleached um, because most of the bread that we have uh, in our in our value chain has gone through some sort of bleaching, whether that's with uh, different peroxides, with um, different uh, bleaching agents, uh, different uh, gassing, and so on. Conversion, what the heck? I'm not sure what they mean here. <laughs> I've, been around the, I've been around the block a few times. Not sure what they mean by conversion. Curing, curing implies that you are taking the different um, 
myoglobins within meat products and converting them to nitrosyl myoglobin or nitrosyl hemoglobin through the addition of uh, sodium nitrite. And sodium nitrate can come from a wide variety of, or nitrate in a period can come from a wide variety of different sources. It could come from smoke. It could come from um, sodium nitrate added directly. It could come from sodium nitrate that's then converted. Oh, perhaps that's conversion. Uh, it, that's converted during microbial fermentation and aging of that meat. It could come from the application of different plant extracts, such as celery extract or acerola extract. Um, different naturally occurring um, plants have high levels of natural nitrite and or other cure accelerators, such as in the case of acerola, it contains a high amount of natural vitamin C, which accelerates the curing. Um, so again, this is one where it's a traditional food processing. It is one that can be done quite clearly with chemicals that are naturally occurring in the environment. So when they say with chemical addition, if I was to pack my meat with celery leaves and we saw a curing occur, would that be considered curing and therefore a maximum process? Deboning, mechanical deboning. And I find that very, very disconcerting when they say that uh, application of um, different technologies within the manufacturing process that are going to increase productivity are somehow uh, impacting on the maximum um, processing character of this product. Decaffeination, this is where there is either supercritical fluids, so the use of carbon dioxide, or the use of different solvents. And so um, carbon dioxide is a chemical, but carbon dioxide is extremely inert and extremely... Um, it's, it's, it's common. It, it, the use of supercritical fluid on food products is extremely common. So for example, if we're decaffeinating coffee using supercritical fluid extraction, that's one thing. But if we are then using supercritical fluid extraction for making health supplements, that's a completely different story. So I, I, I just find it interesting that these judgment calls are made on different processing technologies, but the exact same technology in one case is considered negative and in the other case is considered a positive. The exact same technology. Denaturation, this one's weird because anytime you're cooking something, so on the previous, on the previous um, minimum process list, they were saying cooking is a minimum process. But what are we doing when we are cooking? We are denaturing proteins. We are denaturing starch. We are denaturing all sorts of different things. And yes, that denaturation can occur via chemical means. So let's say, for example, you want to make ceviche. Um, that's a traditional fish dish from um, the northern part of South America, uh, very common in Peru and Colombia, where you take fish and you apply lemon juice and the proteins denature. And that is a chemical change. Is that considered a maximally processed product? According to this list, it is, even though all you have is raw fish and lemon juice. Enzymolysis, again, this is another one where they're saying with chemical addition. So are those enzymes coming from fermentation products? Are those enzymes coming from natural foods? Are those enzymes coming from, um, very few enzymes that are coming from synthetic processes. Um, but any sort of enzyme activity is considered a maximum food process, which is really quite ironic again, because many of the enzymes uh, and enzymatic uh, activities that are occurring within foods are naturally occurring. And most enzymes are naturally occurring and they have their enzyme based processing is incredibly environmentally friendly and it's incredibly, um, it's an incredibly good technology that has minimum health impact for the population. Esterification. This one's interesting too. Uh, uh, esterification is usually used, uh, on uh, different types of arom ar aroma compounds. So if you're making different synthetic flavors, and this is where you're adding ester groups to different chemicals. And so here we are starting to see a lot more in-depth synthetic chemistry going on. Um, Interesterification, I'm going to jump out to this one right now while we're talking about es uh, esterification. Ester groups occur on lots and lots and lots of different chemicals. Uh, many of the esters that we are 
consuming on a daily basis are the aroma compounds that we're finding in natural foods. Um, and so uh, implying that we are able to do that uh, esterification with different uh, chemical modifications, again, belies the fact that many of those chemical modifications are actually naturally occurring or are occurring because we're doing different fermentations and then we're purifying out those uh, different aroma compounds. Interesterification is a very specific type of esterification, and that's related to fats, where you're taking the, the different fatty acids that are found on a triglyceride. On a triglyceride, there's three fatty acids, and what you can do with interesterification is you can very, very discreetly put back fatty acids that you want in a very specific order so that you get a very discreet melting and uh, uh, solidification profile on that fat and get very specific mouthfeel and functionality. And interesterification has been a real boon in terms of improving the um, health-related properties of fats. And we've been able to eliminate most of the hydrogenation that's occurring in uh, historical uh, solid fat stocks by use of interesterification. So a technology that is predominantly benefiting the health of the product and eliminating a less healthful ingredient is being suggested as a negative product because it's a maximum process. Hormonal action, this one's a weird one because any sort of meat, even if no synthetic hormones are being added, has hormones in it. So if you're eating organic beef, you are being exposed to hormones. They are just there. And it is, it's, it's somewhat ironic for them to say, well, we can't use it, we can't we can't have hormones in food because they are there. They're always there. They have been there since time immemorial. Hydrogenation. This one has a lot of good sense behind it, but also um, it's, it needs context. Partial hydrogenation created a lot of trans fats. Full hydrogenation creates a solid fat stock, and then you can allow for interesterification to make that fat stock into a very very discrete signature fat. And again, these are all modeled off of normal biosynthetic processes that, that we see in fats, uh, in fat producing cells in animals and uh, plants. But the moment that we do it in a large fermenter, they consider it a chemical process. Hydrolysis, this one's funny because we do hydro, if, if, if it's a natural aging process, such as in aging meat or cheese, we see natural hydrolysis occurring, but the moment that they say it's a, with a chemical addition, you can't have hydrolysis occurring. But it's okay if it's hydrolysis occurring during aging processes. So, again, all sorts of ironies here. Oxidation. Lots of things oxidize just naturally. So what they're suggesting here is that you can't chemically oxidize something. But if you leave most food products out, they will naturally oxidize. It's just the nature of being in an environment with, with oxygen. Also, the, the redox state of the food product can either encourage or discourage oxidation. Um, and that also leads to reduction. So again, um, they're, they're just suggesting that redox doesn't occur within food products, but it, it occurs naturally all the time. Um, smoking with chemical addition. And so, I, again, I really don't understand what they mean by with chemical addition. When, when you're smoking a product, you're adding chemicals. That's just a given. And so I'm going to suggest that they're, they're saying if you're smoking a product, but you are applying liquid smoke. Um, but from a chemical perspective, it's really not that different than smoking a product where you are hanging it in a flume of smoke. Um, you are seeing increases of nitrosyl hemoglobins within that product. You are seeing all sorts of different um, hydrocarbons being deposited on that product. And I know that I've had discussion with some of the students that I work with, and they found this one quite offensive, that smoking of food products is considered a maximal process. Synthesis. I don't know what they mean by that. <laughs> Synthesis. Tenderizing with chemical addition. So I, it, let's say I'm making chicken and I want to apply pineapple to my chicken. Am I tenderizing it with chemical addition? Absolutely. I'm adding uh, naturally occurring papain to my chicken with pineapple. Um, that's tenderizing. Whereas when they say tenderizing, does that mean the same implication if I was to be needling that product 
or uh, pumping it with sodium phosphate or uh, again, the definition here is not very, very clear. And as such, from my perspective, these terms about maximum and minimum processes are misleading. It does nothing to understand the chemistry and it tries to codify something. So for example, let's say I have a, a, a vegetable salad and it's got, uh, I'm just, I'm just trying to imagine the HACCP process flow diagram for some of the different products that I eat. And quite literally, these become like uh, huge roadmaps with so many different unit operations occurring within that product. You could have a product with one single maximum process occurring, and according to their definitions, it's a highly processed product. Whereas you could have a product with a hundred minimum processes and is considered a minimally uh, processed product. So again, it's misleading to put judgment statements on which processes are maximum and which processes are minimum. From my perspective, it really should be about um, which processes are going to reduce the, the healthfulness of a food product or which processes are going to somehow um, increase the risk when consuming that food product, the absolute risk from uh, continuous consumption of that food product. And honestly, I think putting judgment calls on food products and especially on processing technologies becomes a negative, especially from an innovation perspective. When our government is out there saying, no, we don't like processing technology, it reduces our uh, interest in innovating. So I don't like these labels. I know that's my own opinion and I'm welcome to my own opinion, but for you as a student in the uh, nutrition and food technology program, you need to understand that these labels exist and be able to go out and justify the role of these labels within the different processing technologies that you may be suggesting for new and novel products that you're working on. All right, I'm going to jump back to my slideshow, but I think I am done. Yes, I am done. So do consider all of the different implications when they're saying avoid highly processed foods. If we start to codify these labels even further, this could become problematic and it can become problematic from a, from a novel processing technology perspective that it disincentivizes some of the novel processing technologies that have a really important role to play in terms of extending shelf life and being able to improve accessibility of nutritious food products to a wider variety of consumers. So think about that. You know about the labels and you can interpret uh, some of the science behind that moving forward. All right, take care and we'll talk to you again soon.